So I'm Colin Slater. I work with Eric Bell at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm going to talk about the Monoceros, the scene in PanStars 1. Uh, so this is work that's been done with uh, the PanStars Milky Way group, who I've named or I've listed some of their names here. Uh, but also, I owe lots of credit to the entire PanStars consortium for building a telescope and running a pipeline and getting us all this great data. Um, so to make sure that we're all on the same page, I should start with the a figure that we've all seen and that we all like in, in this field. Um, this is the field of streams from SDSS. So this is just a map of main sequence turnoff stars in the galactic halo. And they're color coded by distance. Um, so we see sort of standing out in red and yellow and green is a Sagittarius stream because Sagittarius is huge and just covers an enormous piece of the sky. Um, you also see uh, little things like PAL-5 and the orphan stream. Um, and a whole bunch of small dwarf galaxies standing out as little spots. But if you look towards the galactic anticenter, sort of on the far right side of the plot, there's a sort of blue haze fluff thing. Um, and that's what we call the Monoceros ring. So, so, oh, I got it. Yeah, I don't know how to operate it. Sure. So it's, it's at sort of high latitudes. It's, it's towards the disk, but, it's, but Sloan only surveyed down to sort of B of 30 degrees or so. So it's really up higher than we would expect like a disk just to be living. Um, so it seemed to have been, been some sort of over density here. But as you can see, that this is, this is really the best picture that existed of Monoceros. And it's incomplete. It goes off the edge. We don't really have a full picture of what it looks like. So this has led lots of controversy. Um, it doesn't look like a stream, like Sagittarius. Sagittarius looks like a stream. Monoceros, it's less clear. Is it a disk? Is it, is it sort of some weird thing about the disk that we don't understand? Is it some sort of weird stream that we don't understand? Where does it come from? Where does it go? All these questions just unanswered by Sloan. Um, and so that's sort of questions that are specific to this one feature in, the, in Milky Way, uh, but more generally, we'd kind of like to know what do disk satellite interactions or uh, look like? What, is, what, do, what do satellites do to the outskirts of the disks? We don't have a very good handle on this because we don't have a lot of examples, but Monoceros is one. Um, so we'd like to know, is this, is this common or is this rare? And to do this, to really know what's going on here, we need good examples, so like Monoceros, and we need good simulations to help us understand these examples that we see. So let's go on to the PanStars data. I'm going to, uh, this is in R8 and DEC. I'm going to reorient you all into galactic coordinates to make this easier to look at. And so the part of Monoceros that we've known is going to occupy this little portion of the, of the screen. But Sloan has a, or sorry, PanStars has this enormous three quarters of the sky footprint. So when I make the same map with PanStars, we get this huge map. And I'll get rid of the Sloan. You see in green, you get the same basic three sort of arcs, these over densities that are extending up way above the disk that we saw in, in Sloan. So we see the same thing there. We also see that extends to both, both sides, left and right here, um, over so like this is 100 degrees. So it's very long. And I'll just have some little bars to highlight the sort of features that we're looking at. You see there are also these sort of sharp edges, uh, sort of telling us that it's something dynamically cold. This is not just an, uh, an exponential disk that's kind of fading away. There's actually a sharp feature here. Um, and the coolest thing about the PanStars map is that not only do we see that Monoceros exists up here in the north, but we see the same sharp edge feature in the south. Basically, it, it just looks like a reflection of PanStars in the north, but on the other side of the disk. And we've never had a map like that before. This is the first time we can say that Monoceros is, clearly has a sharp edge on both sides, north and south of the disk. So those are the features that we see. Um, and it is quite large. Um, and just to fill in, if, you were, uh, if there was just an exponential disk, you'd really get this, you'd really see the density start to sort of taper here and taper here, but the sort of puffing up sort of 60 degrees tall is really unique to the Monoceros ring. That's the view inside of the Milky Way disk. Uh, 
it's nice to sort of think about this schematically for what would we see if we were outside of the Milky Way. Um, so I've actually drawn this to scale to the best I can. So Monoceros is something like eight kiloparsecs away from the sun. So twice as far as the sun is from the galactic center. But then just doing basic geometry of it's at B of 30 degrees and it's at eight kiloparsecs means that this is a really tall feature. It's five kiloparsecs above the disk. It's, it's, it's huge. So if, is this, one typically imagines like, oh, gal galaxies might flare in the outer parts of the disk, but that's just, usually flares are sort of a few, uh, few scale heights or the scale height increasing uh, by a factor of a few, but not five kiloparsec jump all of a sudden. Um, and there might be some hint that there's a distant same symmetry, so I've kind of uh, suggested that, but uh, we don't have the perfect distance indicator, so that's a little less certain. So, giant feature. So we have all this morphological information. We have this very nice map. We can actually see what Monoceros looks like now in a way that we couldn't before. How do we use this? So I said earlier that sort of simulations are the key to understanding what this, what caused this feature and why it looks the way it does. So I'm going to show two models where we've sort of taken, these are models that existed prior to the PanStars data. So they were, they were designed to, to reproduce what was known in Sloan and from other studies. And we're just going to show them up, in the, show them in the same way that I show the um, PanStars data, and to see well, how well do they do at reproducing what we see on the sky. Uh, the first model is an accreted satellite. So in that, the, the there's a dwarf galaxy that came in sort of parallel to the disk, and all the stars in Monoceros are just from that dwarf satellite. There's no disk in this model. Um, in the other case, the disk itself, the Milky Way disk, has been sort of disrupted by dark satellites or something. Something has perturbed it, so it's only disk stars that cause the feature. So this is the accreted satellite model from Penirubia et al. Uh, the, the, this is the observations on the left and the models on the right. Um, so I've plotted them the same way. I've made basically the same sort of distance cuts. Uh, tried to reproduce it as, as closely as I can. Um, I just sort of marked the arcs where we see Monosphorus in green here. And so we do get a nice stream in the south, a nice stream in the north. That seems to sort of reproduce the basic overall idea of Monoceros, um, which is what it was designed to do. So it's, it's good that it does what it's designed to do. Um, looks pretty good. The downside with the, the uh, accreted satellite model is that if I have a satellite galaxy that's falling into the disk, uh, it leaves a big long tidal stream, and that stream kind of has to extend beyond sort of to larger galactocentric radii. So if I go make a map at a larger distance, this is, this is actually a, this is a going out to sort of uh, 14 kiloparsecs from the sun. I see kind of the same thing. I see this is actually Sagittarius there, but nothing really new is popping up. I don't see any other parts of a tidal stream that, are, that I didn't see before. Um, but if I look at the model, then I have all sorts of new features coming in. So this feature diagonal, that didn't exist before. Um, there, are new, there are new parts of the stream that I don't see in, this, in the observations. And so to sort of fix this up, one has to hide those or do something to make the outer parts of the tidal stream sort of not be visible. So this model, some good things, some bad things. It was never, it's not tuned to reproduce this, so I don't want to fault the entire idea, but that's just sort of uh, what we have at the moment. So the other model, if I just take the Milky Way disk and I sort of disrupt it with satellites. Now we're not looking at the satellite stars, we're just looking at the disk. Um, this is from Ketz and Zetas et al. So again, the observations on the left, and here's the disk in this model. You can see that it's really been sort of warped up to 20 degrees, 30 degrees above the, above the plane, um, which that's the right height we need, but you can see that like there's no material left at B of zero. It's basically taken the entire disk and sort of shoved it up to higher, uh, greater heights. And that's maybe a little too much destruction of the disk. Um, it also doesn't reproduce the asymmetry, so we don't see any material down in the south. So. This was just, this was a sort of, I believe this was found serendipitously in a set of simulations. So I don't wanna, this is not, this is not necessarily a problem with this entire category of models, uh, but this does sort of say that, well, we need to, we need to do some more kicking up to higher heights, but we need to 
still keep a disk that remains mostly intact. Um, so again, some good features, uh, some things that uh, sort of future iterations of these models uh, would need to improve on. So we have some first attempts at decoding Monoceros, but we don't have answers yet. Uh, this is still sort of evading any explanation. And we really have way more, we have way more data than we really can interpret with the models. We, these are the sort of the best examples that we had of simulations to reproduce Monoceros, and they don't, they don't quite cut it. So we need to sort of be going towards the model direction to have a better idea. Um, and to do so, I'll just uh, hint at what we're working on at the moment, is we're trying to resolve this more with cosmological simulations where Maybe this wasn't fine-tuned to reproduce Monoceros, but we might be able to find some features that kind of resemble uh, uh, sort of Monoceros-like uh, structures. Um, so I'll just, I'll just hint at some of the examples that we're doing. This is just a suite of six example simulations um, from Marie Martig, and just to get at the hint of all the variations that happen in these simulations. You get big disks, you get disks that disappear, you get lots of streams, you get no streams, you get uh, a, sort of a stream of satellites. You get some sort of fluffy stuff. Um, we haven't gone into every single detail of these, but uh, there's a wide variety of, of, of morphological features, and we're still looking for them. So I'll just end on the pretty picture. Thanks. I, I agree there are way too many parameters to tweak, which is why I've sort of, we've been looking at uh, finding cosmological simulations where we just sort of make do with whatever parameters happen to be, uh, hap or whatever happened to be in that galaxy. Um, and then maybe once we have a handle on that, maybe, maybe some sort of guidance from the, the uncontrolled experiments, then we'll be able to go in and tweak controlled experiments to more accurately reproduce. Monoceros, um, but that that is basically the problem. Monoceros actually is a stream with the other streams actually has an effect on it as well. So there's actually a cross between the streams. So region is not even double checked by the last. Uh, I'd I'd worry slightly more about the satellites from the other streams sort of interacting with the stream material. So maybe the Sagittarius dwarf interacted with the Monoceros stream material. Um, certainly could be possible. I don't know if stream versus stream itself does a whole lot, just because there's not a lot of mass. Well, I have a crazy question. Uh, what is the Earlier we started today with seeing all this mess of very very compact streams inside the halos of galaxies. Uh, why can't the streams be an inheritance of the streams directly rather than having to pass through a virialized phase, be a dwarf, and then being disrupted? Uh, do we resolve the streams well enough to know that uh, they don't keep because they might be dynamically cold uh, memory inside the halo of a galaxy? Would it matter for what we interpret? Because in a sense, if we disrupt the dwarf, might mean something. If we don't disrupt the dwarf, because we never made the dwarf, might be interesting. So I don't know if the, result, so the, the simulations are good enough for us to see whether we could do stream formation in the streams. There are no young stars in the Monoceros. Well, I'm not talking about this particular stream, but my goodness, indeed, it's a field of streams. And it's a very, I mean, I'm curious about this question. Anyway, let's thank them Colin again and the a figure that we've all seen and that we all like in, in this field. Um, this is the field of streams from SDSS. So this is just a map of main sequence turnoff stars in the galactic halo, and they're color coded by distance. Um, so we see sort of standing out in red and yellow and green is the set of
So I'm Colin Slater. I work with Eric Bell at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm going to talk about the Monoceros, the scene in Panstars 1. Uh, so this is work that's Sagittarius stream. Like I said, Sagittarius is huge and just covers an enormous piece of the sky. Um, you also see uh, little things like PAL-5 and the Orphan stream, um, and a whole bunch of small dwarf galaxies standing out as little spots. But if you look towards the galactic anti-center, sort of on the far right side of the plot, there's a sort of blue haze fluff thing. Um, and that's what we call the Monoceros ring. So, so, oh, I got it. Yeah, I don't know how to operate it. Sure. So it's, it's, at, it's been done with uh, the Panstars Milky Way group, who I've named, or I've listed some of their names here. Uh, but also, I owe lots of credit to the entire Panstars consortium for building a telescope and running a pipeline and gritting us all this great data. Um, so to make sure that we're all on the same page, I should start with 